Today's episode is brought to you by the University of Hawaii College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources and the Livestock Extension Group. Aloha, welcome everyone to the Livestock Balaao, a podcast aimed to provide educational support, information, guidance, and outreach to livestock stakeholders in Hawaii. We are your hosts, Mele Oshiro and Shane and Sam. Today we'll be talking about managing your grazing lands. To do that, we're going to introduce you to Carolyn Wong Aveloa, who is the State Grazing Lands Management Specialist with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, or NRCS for short, in Camuela. So I first met Carolyn during my undergrad studies over at UH Hilo, um, or maybe through some mutual friends. Uh, I can't really remember for sure which came first, but fast forward to many years later and our paths crossed again. While I was working as a research assistant for a project with uh, UHC Tar, and I was sent out to go meet with Carolyn. I was like, wow, I wonder if that's the same Carolyn that I know. And sure enough, we both walked in and went, oh, it is the person I know. <laughs> so, um, you know, and since then, we've kind of continued to work alongside in many different capacities and projects. And I'm going to hand it over to Carolyn so she can share with us more about um, a little bit about her background and her programs and what she wor- does with the NRCS. Yeah, so excited. Hey, ladies. Yes, thanks for having me on your show today. Um, And Mele, it has been a long but wonderful uh, journey uh, with you at different times. Always been a pleasure to work with you. And I'm so grateful we can continue to do that. Um, It is funny, isn't it, how we start (laughs) out um, many, many, many years ago. um, (laughs) That was a lot of many. How many? (laughs) It seems like forever ago now. Yeah. Um, I I, I came from Lahaina. I am a Lahaina Luna graduate. And um, Lahaina Luna has an ag program. I'll be really honest, I was in that program for all the wrong reasons. But anyway, um, I got through high school and um, decided to continue to pursue this elusive idea of um, maybe studying agriculture and and getting a job. I actually came across an old um, scholarship essay where I said in that essay that I wanted to get in a career that involved land management. And I had no idea at the time um, what NRCS even was. I had no idea what this agency was or did. And it was while I was a student at UH Hilo that um, I learned about NRCS. My professor I was working for at the time, um, Dr. Randy Sinok, he uh, encouraged me to consider applying for an internship that I had heard was being advertised. So um, I was I pursued my Bachelor of Science at UH Hilo. I got my uh, degree in agroecology and environmental science. And um, it was a great degree path. Um, it basically um, focused on that area where agriculture and the environment kind of overlap. And it's a perfect degree path for the work that natural resource conservation services do. Um, I got that internship and I, I trained for two summers as a, as a student. And upon graduation, they offered me a full-time permanent position here in Waimea. Um, my first position with the agency, I was a soil conservationist. So as a soil conservationist, I did conservation planning work with farmers and ranchers, foresters, just folks that are doing different things on their land, um, mostly geared around agriculture or um or natural resource management um, for like native uh, endangered species and whatnot. I was a conservation planner um, in the Waimea office for about 13 years. Um, During that time, I worked with many farmers and ranchers and we would uh, basically, as a conservation planner, we come alongside folks and help them in what they're trying to do and help them to do it in the most beneficial way possible for them and the environment. And so we strive to help them identify ways to improve, enhance, or preserve um, their land. Our our model used to be helping people help the land. And that really summed it up really, really well. Mm -hmm. Um, The Natural Resource Conservation Service is a agency in the US Department of Agriculture. So we're a federal agency. Um, We provide service to land managers free of charge. They don't pay a dime for the services that we provide. Um, we are funded by taxpayer money. Um, we are federal, so we are all across the country, um, including uh, the American territories. Uh, the Pacific Islands area, area that I work for, um, we ha- encompass Hawaii, American Samoa, Guam, Saipan, 
and the Commonwealth of the Marianas Islands, as well as we have two uh, staff positions in Ponape and Palau. In 2016, after about 13 years as a planner in the field office, I was um, able to apply for the position of the state rangeland or grazing land management specialist. I had just finished my master's degree uh, with Utah State University about a year before. And by that time in my career, um, I had worked a lot with ranching and I was very, very interested. I had gotten very, very interested in the ecology of grazing lands and a few years before decided to uh, pursue my master's degree. Um, I did most of it through distance programs uh, that I was really grateful. At the time, it wasn't very common. Uh, Utah State University was very, very supportive and flexible. And I had a great major professor who worked with me. Um, I was able to work with Mark Thorne and Mele, and they helped me to get my research project done and um, got that written up for my thesis. Cool. My thesis focused on fireweed and the problems that it creates in Hawaii. And we were exploring whether we could find complementarities to the toxin in fireweed, whether we could provide a complementary secondary compound that would effectively protect cattle from the ill effect that fireweed causes and see if we couldn't use um, cattle as more of a control for fireweed. Um, yeah, it was a very interesting study, um, very interesting experience. And um, it, it was just a part of my path. Um, so since 2016, I have been in this new role of what we call a technical specialist. Mm -hmm. um, so as the grazing land management specialist, I am responsible for conservation program in Hawaii or in the Pacific Islands area on grazing lands, more or less, me and my team. But um, the development of tools and practice uh, test technical specifications, um, providing training to the field staff, all of that uh, falls on to my purview. Um, <clears throat> I am also involved in the development of ecological site descriptions uh, with our soil survey office. So ecological site descriptions are similar to our soil survey maps. Uh, they're kind of similar in that sense where we're trying to classify and categorize the different ecological types um, across the islands. Very daunting task. Um, Especially with so many different like species and just everything here. Oh, climate goodness. zones, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's very, very complex. Um, so lots of, lots of work to do always, um, always. I'm going to throw a question at you. I mean, I think I have a lot of questions and I tend to pick Carolyn's brain about a lot of things and we do um, about a, a, all kinds of different things. But I think, you know, natural resource management, when Shannon and I were talking, it's it's tough because nature is nature as a mind of its own. Um, and, you know, I mean, we see that already, you know, in, in many different areas right now, dealing with the drought and all this stuff in our in our Hurricane own state season, and across flooding, the across the, na the nation. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I guess, can you share something in your planning ex when you in your planning days, maybe some of the common challenges that you found that ranchers or producers deal with um, mm -hmm. here and as far as like in pasture and grazing management and how, you know, you worked around or how did they resolve some of those issues or big challenges, I guess, the common challenges you can see across everyone. Sure, sure. Oh, man. Um, for sure, the, the biggest one are some of the ones that you guys mentioned, um, especially affecting ranchers is drought, wildfire. Those are the two biggest ones that affected the folks that I worked with the most. Invasive species would be another one. And so, you know, across the board with all, everyone that we work with, um, we are, obviously we're, we're working to address the, the real obvious or um, specific natural resource concerns that there might be. Maybe it's a inadequate water situation for, you know, livestock, or maybe it was a soil erosion problem. But along with that and kind of always in the background is um, a lot of discussions about sustainability and resilience and how can we help, how can we work together to make their land as healthy mm -hmm. and as um, strong as we can and resilient as we can so that they can, they can withstand these different natural resource uh, challenges when they come because they will come. Um, oh, yeah. But when we can, but when we can do what we can to work together to make sure that the plant community in the pasture is diverse and uh, healthy and thriving and vigorous, 
uh, when we can be working together, make sure that the soils are healthy and strong and we've got really good environment for, for supporting that plant community, that we can make sure that the hydrologic function of that landscape, because everything is part of a watershed, right? Mm -hmm. And we can be sure that even our grazing lands are um, well equipped to, to provide the function of water infiltration and filtering um, in order to absorb as much water that can be absorbed when it falls um, and take it deep into the soil profile. Those types of things are in all of our conversations or they should be with, with ranchers. Um, mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> I'd say in dealing with, with mother nature, um, we just wanna try to work together to make that land as strong and resilient as possible and, and really work with the producers too, to add wherever we can some perspective on um, maybe some, 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 uh, some new level of understanding mm -hmm. of ecology. Because in Hawaii, particularly, just about all of our grazing lands are managed like rangeland. They're managed with the ecology right. of the area. We, don't, we have very little land that's irrigated, very little land that's fertilized or seeded on a regular basis, like is common in the mainland when you talk right. about pasture. Yeah, we're in this kind of weird, funky space because Hawaii doesn't have any real, um, well, it's not considered to have had native rangelands because we didn't have any native grazing animals aside from the birds. Right, right. <laughs> Yeah, you, you talk about soil health too. And I think that's another good um, or yeah. important part, right? Because I think that's essentially what keeps everything productive as well. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because a lot of folks come in and ask, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to test my soils and whatnot. I'm like, well, you have grass grazing, you have grass growing. They're like, yeah. It's like, yeah. So yeah. So how, how can you maybe, I guess, before they start to dive into really doing so soil quality stuff, what should they be looking for in their generalized pastures to understand, you know, and make it more productive for them to not have to sample a whole entire pasture, but look at those areas, you know, what kind of key things are they looking for in those areas if they're managing to ensure it's um, healthy, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good question. So where soil testing is involved is, is mostly looking at like the soil fertility. Mm -hmm. And I'm very pocket. So I take it from that practical perspective of if right. it ain't broke, don't fix it. Fix it right. So right. unless unless you're having like um, very um, unless you're having problems on the pasture that you think could be related to soil fertility, like mm -hmm. your grasses are just real pale and yellowish, mm -hmm. or you're seeing other signs that there could be some kind of a micronutrient deficiency, like purplish leaves or you know, other things that could be suggestive that there's a problem. Most of the time, especially our pastors that have been in pasture for a really long time, they're, they're usually already populated with plants that are adapted to that environment. And unless there's a problem with production, we usually don't even pursue that soil fertility question. We're looking more for soil health from the aspect of um, not having any soil erosion, having good aggregate structure, that supports good water infiltration, having um, diverse plants that have different rooting depths, having a, a ecosystem that supports uh, even healthy insect populations, things like that um, is, is kind of where we focus more of our soil health um, work on pasture or in grazing lands, um, making sure it's covered, not disturbed, got diverse roots and, is, and good, good growing plants, you know, pretty much all the time. Right. In our native environment, we didn't have any grazing animals, right? But we did have oh, lots of wow. ground birds that consumed things at the ground level. Um, we don't know very much about them per se, but um, it's, not it's not impossible that they utilize some of the native grasses that we do have, as well as some of the other native forbs and low growing mm -hmm. shrubs and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So obviously right. not about forest birds, but you never know with your audience nowadays. Through your planning programs that you have at NRCS, um, the other programs that farmers and ranchers can get support from in their existing operations, do you, can you share more about some of those programs that you folks offer through NRCS? Oh, yeah, sure. Sure, yeah. So our conservation technical assistance program is that planning program that mm -hmm. just, just provides technical assistance, assistance, technical advice. It's free. It's available to whoever comes and asks for it. Uh, but we do also administer farm bill programs. Mm -hmm. um, the farm bill programs can sometimes provide financial assistance to help a producer implement solutions on their land to 
address natural resource problems. So for example, a rancher has a problem with um, a really bad invasive species, like the two-line spittlebug. Mm -hmm. And it's causing all kinds of issues. Um, and uh, those issues are, are also bad for the environment. Sometimes uh, we have programs, one of them, for example, is the Environmental Quality Incentives Program that can come alongside them. And from the, the technical assistance they got, we've developed a conservation plan. Mm -hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. the program can come alongside and say, okay, um, for the practices in your plan, this program can help with offset some of the costs mm -hmm. that it's going to take to adopt some of those and implement some of those practices. Mm -hmm. So practices are things like fence or brush management or pasture and hay planting, mm -hmm. pipelines, stuff like that. So that's the EQIP program, right? Correct. Oh, okay. The, I was like, I've never heard anyone actually say all the acronyms out loud. And I was like, oh, oh. that's what it stands for. <laughs> I was like, yes. <laughs> Yes, that's the EQIP program. And I try not to talk in acronyms, but they're No, they're I appreciate you not later. doing that. That was a discussion we had the other day. I was like, oh, yeah. confusing. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so to be eligible for EQIP, um, mm -hmm. basically a, a producer just needs to come and express interest in the program. Um, the field office will really be the first um, step for them to determine their eligibility. But in general, um, some of the general uh, eligibility requirements are they have to have control of the land. So they either have to own it or have a lease on it. And the lease has to be long enough to allow them to implement the plan. Um, they have to have their records updated with the Farm Service Agency. Oh, Farm Service wow. Agency is our sister agency and mm -hmm. they will establish them in the USDA system and um, get a bunch of their uh, paperwork squared away. Um, they have to be compliant with the highly rotable land and wetland conservation compliance rules. Um, they have, to, and the field office can help them determine whether they are or they're not. They have to meet the AGI uh, limitation. So AGI stands for adjusted gross income. And what that is um, seeking to do is, um, you can only, you're only eligible if your average adjusted gross income over the last three years is 900,000 or less unless it's all coming from agriculture. So that's to help, you know, make sure we're not giving the money to the movie stars or, you know, yeah. professional yeah. athletes. A lot of money. Athletes. That much money in three years. So. You'd be surprised how many the people that come in to apply. But we try to make sure that <laughs> the funding is going to folks that it's intended for, yeah. folks that really need the help to implement yeah. practices. Um, and, and so 900,000 or less, unless majority of that comes from agriculture. Like mm -hmm. if, if somebody's making good money because they're just big and they're a successful farm, that's okay. I believe yeah. I, they need to double check with the field office. But the last well, I- Because also sometimes it. that's like, you might've hit a, a a part in the like ag cycle where it's really high for those three or four years. So I was like, cause I know when I worked not here on the mainland in extension, I was like, there were a few years when I was working in the teens and I was like corn and soybeans, people were making bank, but now not, not as much, yeah. you know? So, yeah. yeah. The cattle, the cattle market similarly went through yeah. this really yeah. crazy I mean, high swing. Yeah. It's like, and, what was it? 2014, 2015. Yeah. I think even 2016, like I was like, it was like, woo. Cause I yeah. did a lot of papers on like purchasing like bread heifers versus like unbred and like long-term returns. And I was like, it was amazing. It was completely different than what it would be now. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So that's the equip program. So yeah. have control of land, be eligible as far as farm service agency and the AGI requirements um, are, are specific, specified and then have a natural resource problem that the program can help you with. Cause that's the, the purpose of that program is to solve these problems. Somebody already has all their problems all kind of figured out. They can still come and approach our, our offices because we have other programs. Um, one of them is the conservation stewardship program. And that program is for folks that kind of already have most of their issues all buttoned up. And they're, they don't really have any more problems per se, but they might be interested in talking story about if there were a little bit more they could do to kind of, you know, um, take it to the next level, you know, even, yeah. even healthier, even better. Um, so the conservation stewardship program uh, seeks to provide incentives for that type of, of activity. So um, pretty much anybody that's that's doing ag, um, you know, can can provide can probably get some kind of benefit mm -hmm. from working with their local conservationist. Yeah, yeah. If for no other reason than to create your own plan, I was like, I would think it would help. 
Um, and also just establishing yourself within, I know a lot of people don't like to establish themselves within the federal government or kind of get on that radar, but that's really yeah. one of the best ways to get funding, to be honest. So at least in, yeah. again, in my experience, I don't know about Malay or Carolyn, but yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, for sure. And Farm Service Agency, they often have some programs that can be helpful when you need it, you know, sure. sometimes, especially right, right now with all the disasters that are affecting people. I was going to say over the last year and a half, they've had some really nice ones. If you were lucky to hop on it and stuff, I was like, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, the the services and programs that they provide, it's good. It's good to get on the list and just have that communication with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so is there any specific, you know, Shannon and I were talking about, we have little mini episodes that we do and we're talking about record keeping. So are, yeah. are there specific records that um, would be yes. really important for these programs for people to be keeping? So if they do start to think about, I'm going to apply or want to, is there specific records they should be keeping as far as um, their yeah. production numbers or um, yield? Yeah. Or or things like that, yeah. that they need to be aware of. Um, you know, when, when they have their economic data, it's sure helpful because one of the things that we try to do through the conservation planning process is help them consider like do like a cost benefit analysis mm -hmm. of option A or option B or option right. C. So, uh, but if they don't have that kind of information, it presents a challenge. Most of them have a good idea. Um, and we're not trying to get all up in their business and know all their numbers, yeah. but I don't even need, really need to know necessarily what their um, what the actual dollars and cents ended up being at the end, but more of the numbers as far as like, well, what did your calf crop look like? Um, right. You know, what percentage of your herd is actually productive? Right. Because a lot of times for us, it's we're getting down to talking about um, their grazing management, mm -hmm. and their grazing mm -hmm. management is going to be linked to their herd size. And the productivity of that herd and are their nutritional needs being met in a way that is optimal for what they're trying to produce, you know, um, or if they're grass finishing, then again, okay, why well, are you hitting your goals? Are you keeping track to know if you're hitting your goals? Mm -hmm. um, they usually have a good idea of, of what a lot of those types of numbers are like. Mm -hmm. It sure is nice when they have it specifically. <laughs> so we're not just guessing. Um, that's yeah. Um, other record keeping that we encourage our, um, through, through our grazing management practice in particular is keeping records of their grazing rotations and numbers, um, keeping records of their rainfall um, and, and knowing what their normal rainfall is like for their environment because we do have so much variability. And it, especially on the big island, we are don't always have the best coverage of weather stations and climate stations. So well, and it's hard because we have eleven of the world's thirteen subclimates here. So it's you have to have mm -hmm. a lot of them just to keep track of them. And even within those little pockets, yeah, yes. it's a lot of difference. You know, yeah, yeah absolutely, so. absolutely, yeah. It changes very quickly over a very short distance. So yeah, uh, it does. yeah, those are some of the basic ones. If we're working with uh, farmers. Um, then we're wanting to, you know, if they have records, obviously, on their nutrient applications or their um, pesticide, if they use any pesticides, how they're used, what they're using, um, when. Um, there's there's definitely lots of other types of records that are more specific right. to different types of land use. Yeah, and I know we're, we're the livestock while out talking to Carolyn, and we always talk about livestock, but these NRCS programs are, are not available, just for not yeah. just for livestock. They're, they're for open to farmers and um production in any kind of other crops um, yeah orchard crops, crops so. veggies yep I don't know why I just want to say veggies right now it comes to mind <laughs> but I was like I I, I know like because I know some people in because I work across all commodities I was like several people in like the coffee industry and stuff have taken advantage of mm -hmm. um working with people from NRCS to help them like yeah you know, better yeah we do our best to to help everybody so, no, no matter what yeah. they're doing to, to, to do what they're trying to do and, and, you know, help the environment wherever possible. So yeah. in Fona, we work with a lot of orchards. In Hilo, we work with a lot of truck farmers and yeah. ranchers and up here in Waimea. We, I mean, we even service like taro farmers in Waipio. You mm -hmm. know, we even try to see what we can do to help them and um, all of the above, all of the above. That's amazing. Yeah. Talking about records, you know, animal performance stuff, I think is very important because that really starts to show you how your land is 
uh, working for you and being productive for you. Because if your animals are producing and performing well, then that's really a reflection of your management strategies in your grazing, as well as your um, production in your area. So, yeah. Yeah. A lot of our um, clients or the, the folks that we service, um, a lot of them are weekend ranchers, weekend warriors, you know, um, agriculture being what it is today um, and, and the land. Especially here. <laughs> yeah. Just the cost to get into land. it here is very, yes. very high. So, yeah. right. Unless exactly. you have family long term in it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so a lot of our ranches are, are on the smaller end. Um, mm -hmm. And so for those folks, it's, it can be difficult to um, treat your treat your operation as a, a hardcore business, mm -hmm. but we do try to help them in you know do keep track enough of the numbers enough so that they can make good decisions, um, particularly when they're considering something that's going to cost them a considerable investment. You know, and being able to to really do a good job weighing the cost benefit. That's that's ultimately the goal. We don't want anyone to regret a decision because they didn't have you know, all of the, all the cards on the table, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, when making that decision. So it sounds like some of the producers can use a lot of these programs to help them manage risk and whatnot too on their properties or in the, the herds or whatnot that they're doing. So how, mm -hmm. how would you say that these programs could help them in that sense and managing risk Manage within risk. their production? Um, that's a great question. For managing risk, I think it mostly our programs can benefit them. It kind of comes back to that subject of resiliency and, mm -hmm. and having their landscapes be as, as strong and resilient as possible, as well as um, as efficient, keeping their, their system as efficient as they can mm -hmm. um, in order to, to, to try to be cost efficient in a way that helps them better buff it the ups and downs of, um, right. the, you know, the things that can affect their economics. So I think that's kind of probably the best ways that, that our, our programs can help them manage risk. Mm -hmm. And if they can get into CSP, um, you know, that provides a, an annual payment for them to keep doing a good job, mm -hmm. which again, kind of provides a little bit of a buffer. It's not a whole ton of money, but mm -hmm. it's, it's a little something that can something help. Is better than nothing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And if they put that back into, you know, investments to improve their land yeah. or their operation in whatever ways that they need, mm -hmm. it will help them in the long run, I think, to be better insulated to risk. Right. Yeah, for sure. So you must be, I mean, I can keep throwing questions at Carolyn, but um, maybe you can share with us some of the one or some instances, you know, you probably helped so many different people on planning different things. Um, but I'm sure there's stuff that probably stuck out to you or had a, you know, big impact in your position um, or just your work. You know, I mean, when you go out there and help somebody, it just, it just feels good to be able to go out there. So you want to share maybe on one of your um, impactful mm -hmm. stories. Gosh, I'm going to put you on a spot. No. <laughs> That's hard. Um, right. I know. Cause you probably worked in so many, in so, so many, many different capacities, but I think, you know, I mean, yeah, you, you can mush them all together. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, one of my, one of my, one of the bright spots for me in my career, and there's so many really, um, I got to help a, a ranch put in a very large reservoir that had been a dream of the rancher for a really long time. Mm -hmm. um, and we got to help put together the technical um, information as, as well as um, help offset some of the costs to, to put in a big, a really big water storage system. Mm -hmm. And I just know, you know, water, you know, even culturally it was a, uh, had a connotation of wealth. Yeah, vai vai wealthy and water makes so much possible. And for this instance, it really did. It made a lot of things possible. It made um, the ranch more water secure and less mm -hmm. prone to water shortages and drought. And it also provided you know, new opportunities for them to, to explore um, other things like, like irrigation and stuff. And so that was a, that was a huge one. Mm -hmm. um, I worked with another ranch that had been operating on this landscape for a really long time and had a hard time um, 
making change, but we, he, he didn't really have um, a lot in the way of a rotation and it was difficult to convince him of the benefit of adopting a rotational grazing system because he didn't, he didn't necessarily um, think that it, he stood to gain much. But one of the things that was really cool by going through the process and walking with him through, helping him see on his landscape what constant grazing was doing. It was, you know, we, we thought he didn't even have any more Kikuyu grass because you could, you couldn't find it anywhere. Mm -hmm. It looked like all carpet grass. And um, we also, I asked him to share his numbers with me and it was difficult to get that information. But once we finally did, we realized his calf crop was actually really poor. Um, it was yeah. just barely better than 50%, which, you know, for the industry, that's, that's not, that's nowhere near acceptable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're aiming for 80% or better. Um, and so by helping him identify these things, and walk him through and help him see the cost benefit, because with every cow that was on his land, it was costing him money. He had to pay money for their water was very expensive. He had to, and then of course, for all of the vaccinations and health supplements that the cows did get when they came in once a year. Um, it was costing him all this money and he was getting very little return back. So when I was able to help him walk down that road and give him a safe space in which to walk down that road and just assess the situation from just the practical realities of what it's costing and what he was actually getting, I could help him see how actually bringing his herd size down and D stuff because he would always tell me, you cannot tell me I got to get rid of cows. I need every single cow on this land. <laughs> that seems like, like, like a rancher thing, doesn't it? I, I understand. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I said, I understand what you're saying, but if that cow is not paying her rent and she's not doing you any good and you she's don't need her out there. So when we could put the numbers together to say, okay, I mean, it was real rough kind, like just pen and paper numbers, like approximately what are we doing here? What does it cost? And just, just, running those basic numbers, running that little analysis, I saw the light bulb go on for him. And he realized all these non-productive cows are the reason I'm not profitable. Mm -hmm. And he immediately, I did it after that. I just had to get out of the way because he immediately started making decisions to get those animals out of and his resources on the animals that were productive. And then he also was willing to listen to me about getting some cross fences in and training these cows to get into a rotation and you know his pastures rebounded so beautifully I mean to see the response on the land afterwards was just an extra you know was gravy I mean we we found kikuyu grass where we thought we hadn't had it anymore and then now I got to work with him on all right let's let's nurse this land back to health and build its resilience and I, I believe he's still pretty happy with the system that we put together I haven't been able to work with him for some time now but I know he continues to to work with our planners and you know, it's kind of on to the next thing and the next thing. Because mm -hmm. when you're that far, when you feel that far underwater, it's very, very hard to even begin dreaming about building a boat, let alone the yacht, right? Yeah. So, um, to help him get his head above water first, to be able to get to that place and then become stronger and stronger. And, and then now he's, he's tackling other issues is really, really gratifying. That's awesome. That is yeah. awesome. Yeah, sometimes you just have to really paint the picture for them, yeah, to be able to see and um, it does, t sometimes it takes an outside person to kind of paint it for you to yeah. be able to show you yeah, those things that are hurting you in the long run, but mm -hmm. absolutely. Sometimes yeah. you're just too close to it to see uh -huh. it mm -hmm. and, and having that outside perspective is, is really, really valuable. Mm -hmm. But, you know, after spending as much time in this career as I have, um, I really, really come to realize and understand and appreciate just how important relationships are. Mm -hmm. You know, a rancher doesn't want to talk to you and share these kinds of details and, and really make themselves vulnerable in this way mm -hmm. unless they feel like they can trust you. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's so, so important. And so, you know, um, I felt good that I had finally gotten to a place where we could have that conversation yeah. and he could realize, like, I'm not trying to be critical of you. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm wanting to help you and mm -hmm. we can just get through these difficult conversations, we might get to a place where, okay, what can help, what, what does helping you look like? Mm -hmm. You know, what is it that needs to happen? And, and get to a place where we could agree on those things and understand why, why that was important. That all takes time. 
Mm -hmm. you know, that development of that relationship and, and the, the time to put together that type of an assessment, but it's so worthy. It's so worth it. And I don't know how we get there without making those investments. It's very, it is very gratifying, as you say, when you can see those um, changes and help it, you know, turn something around for somebody and um, yeah. have a positive impact in their production and whatnot. So yeah. Um, I guess with that, Tamla, anything else would you like to share? You know, you guys to do all these land EKG programs. I remember coming out, um, whatnot. Is there any, um, programs on the horizon for NRCS? I mean, I know it's hard cause everything's been kind of, you know, oh, it's hard. You want to plan something, but then it might just get shut down if you plan it. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. we know that feeling, don't we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Oh, uh, we had so many plans that COVID has had to put on the back burner. Mm -hmm. Um, but we are, um, we have been doing outreach with the GLC, uh, doing some, um, rainfall simulator uh, demonstrations. Those are really fun. We went around the Island uh, a couple years ago and we mm -hmm. did it. And I yeah. think, you know, it'd be really fun to do again. I'm trying to get it to the other islands. We did take it to Lihue. It was really well received there. Um, and it's just really, it, it really makes a difference when people can see, soil and oh well, yeah because you're seeing live soil samples and the differences like because i've seen it not not here but like on the mainland and it's amazing to see like they'll pull it from like even the same field but different spots that are better or less well taken care of and with the cows yeah. tromping on it and then like them doing it but it's amazing to see it is so and cool. it it sends that message home more effectively than any powerpoint or any presentation or mm -hmm. talk ever can Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's always a real delight for me to take that around and, and because everybody can, can get something from it too, from, you know, the five-year-olds in the family mm -hmm. to, to the, the grandpas and, and everybody in between. Um, it, it often leads to so many fun questions and conversations, and that just opens the door for, again, talking about these, what do healthy landscapes look like and what are the different mm -hmm. things that are affecting mm -hmm. that landscape's mm -hmm. health and its function. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, as soon as COVID will allow, um, we we want to do more of those. We definitely could, would love to work together with some partners to look for uh, grazing, you know, workshop type things that we can help to sponsor um, or help to coordinate. Um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, we've done stuff in the past with low stress animal handling, um, lots of different grazing management types of projects, um, looking even at uh, the carbon cycle and carbon sequestration on grazing lands. We, we brought in speakers that kind of covered the gamut um, and we'd love to continue to do that. Um, we've also brought in guys that talk about economics. Um, ranching <laughs> for profit was out here a few times. And so, yeah, yeah all that stuff, it's all connected. You know, mm -hmm. it, it really is all connected um, to, to the management and, and there's, there's little pieces that connect them all. Um, when you can improve or, or enhance one part of it, it just helps the whole thing to float a little better. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're also working um, and trying to build some relationships during COVID um, with some of our other partners that maybe we haven't worked too closely with before. Mm -hmm. um, the university has a wildlife lab, I think they call it themselves. And so getting into that conversation of um, those conversations around uh, non-native wildlife and the impacts that they have on landscapes, particularly when their numbers get out of control no. or, and or when landscapes get impacted by drought. Mm -hmm. You know, that's been a very, very hot topic in Maui mm -hmm. County for the last yeah. couple of years. And it's, it's gaining momentum here because uh, you've got very, very large herds that are growing um, in some areas and having very severe impacts in some areas. And then I hear from ranchers that other areas are really low their numbers and you know, whether that's from uh, some type of uh, eradication effort that had been implemented at some time or, mm -hmm. or over, over utilization of the resource, I'm, I'm not really clear, but um, we wanna be parts of those. We wanna be a part of those conversations because I think some of the tools that we use for assessing landscape health can be really useful for incorporating into wildlife management planning mm -hmm. because ultimately our landscape has a carrying capacity that mm -hmm. that it's that, that it has right now and mm -hmm. when we're stocked heavier than that whether it's domestic livestock or non-native um, wildlife we are affecting that land and and not in good ways um, and so you know we're trying to get into those conversations more and more um, it's a little bit of a dicey area um, as you can imagine there's some controversial things in there but 
we're focused on the health of the land and, and the health of the resources. And it's all connected. Whatever is happening on the land is affecting the ocean. And so, you know, as much as we can make those connections and see where, where we as humans in this ecosystem can be responsible for our kuleana and, and taking care of things because we are the predator in this case. There are no other natural predators that keep right. these in check. We are the management. We are the ones with, mm -hmm. you know, the manao and the understanding to, to try and um, be wise about what we're allowing to happen. I spent a lot of time thinking about that lately. You know, mm -hmm. no action is actually a choice. Mm -hmm. And we are paying dearly in a lot of ways for no action decisions. So there's that. Um, Puline Spittlebug. COVID doesn't really stop us too much from uh, some of the work that we're trying to do there. That's good. Trying to uh, work alongside Mark and his team um, and really try to answer some of the other questions um, that really fall into our, our, our realm of uh, trying to figure out solutions to the problems that are being created by the two lines middle bug. Mostly um, solutions that are involving uh, planting resistant species. Mm -hmm. So I've got a bunch of different field planting projects that we're working on gathering data, trying different methods, trying to figure out what can work and that is scalable. Um, mm -hmm. And so we've, we're halfway through many, many projects um, and just starting to get some really cool results. Um, and now trying to see what, what is those are repeatable and uh, what can we um, then say, all right, we have a strategy that can work for these mm -hmm. situations. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, continue pursuing solutions for those strategies that, you know, we're still lacking. Um, we have a prototype that we just just put together um, for a light trap that we are trying to see if we can develop a, a low cost, um, simple light trap that can be used to um, confirm a uh, low level spittle bug. When, when spittle bugs first get on a landscape, they can be very hard to find mm -hmm. when they first arrive. Um, but light traps can be very effective um, because they're attracted to that light that we might be able to, to know earlier before the grass all starts to die and before the weeds all start to take over that the spittle bug has arrived mm -hmm. and then be in a better position to start monitoring and um, being ready to respond to the problems that spittle bug usually brings with it. Um, we, we just put together a, a new website on the spittle bug. Um, it's www.tlsbhawaii.com. And on that website, Several partners were involved in putting it together, but um, there's pretty much almost all the information that we have on the spittle bug, it, you know, in, in a nutshell. I mean, we try not to make it too long and boring, but there are lots of links to additional resources, information on the bug itself, on what producers can do. Um, and as we learn more and we get better um, information on what, what can be done, we'll be trying to use that as another communication platform to get that information out to people. Yeah, that is awesome. I saw the website and thanks for inviting me out to go and um, see some of the plantings that you guys did. Cause that's, it was very impressive, um, you know, to be able to see and good um, to see, just to see, right. That there's, it just provides some hope, I think for people to be able to know yeah. that there is going to be something that will be able to try to replace some of the grasses that, have been displaced due to the spittle bug. So mm -hmm. it's good. Very, very good. Yeah. Yeah. That day was very awesome. Um, it's nice to, for us too, to know like, okay, we know that this can actually work and we know what the planting rate needs to be in order to get to this fire mm -hmm. outcome. And, you know, all of that kind of information because Kona is so unique. It's yeah. so unique. You, you can't take solutions that work in, the Midwest or even in the Western rangelands and be like, yeah. Oh, here's all you got to do. Yeah. Like, no, <laughs> actually when you no, only got this yeah. much soil out <laughs> there, um, it's not going to work. You can't and even so... take things that work in, on Hamakua or I was going to say, yeah, you can't take things Kona, that work in one you know, area so... to another part of the same Island. So yeah, no, <laughs> true, true. Good point. That's exactly right. Kona is just, you know, the, the environment there is just sometimes its own little creature, I think. And you got to kind of yeah. treat it that way. And, um, you know, so that's yep. good. Yeah. Yeah. God must have thought I was getting bored or something because here he went and slapped me up with a huge challenge. Um, all of <laughs> us, you know, I mean, I'm not the only one trying to find solutions, but I was like, wow, 
didn't see this coming and never in my wildest dreams that I imagined that we'd see a new invasive species that is having the kind of impact that this little bug is having. Exactly. It's just kind of going. It's, it's just crazy. kind of going. Yeah. It's definitely job security for a long time yeah. because <laughs> the cards are still falling, um, you know? Yeah. So- yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, read. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, it's not something that definitely is going to go away in the next um, few years or, um, no. you know, but hopefully we'll have some type of um, management strategies for them or just, you know, the uh, alternative forages that we can use and stuff. And yeah. so that's um, what we want to hope one, for and be hopeful. One silver lining that the spittle bug has provided a couple of them. Number one, I get to work with ranchers again has been fantastic um <laughs> with my field offices but you know putting our heads together being on the two line spittle bug subcommittee um you know we got some ranchers on there and we've we've been able to brainstorm and and that's where a lot of these ideas are coming together you know is, is as we kind of do this together um so getting to work with them again has been fantastic and um it's gotten me in the field a lot and i'm so grateful for that but um also the um greater appreciation for biodiversity um, because Kikuyu grass is such a monoculture because it's so aggressive. Um, it it kind of makes itself vulnerable in that say in that way. But now, you know, we we really get a, a huge appreciation for just why biodiversity is important. Mm-hmm. It's not easy to get. When you have healthy Kikuyu grass pasture, it is not easy to get. But I have had the pleasure of working with some pretty awesome grazing managers that have managed to have some diversity in there. And you know, what what you can mix in with Kikuyu grass really depends on where you are, mm-hmm. but um, there's almost always something that you can have in addition to Kikuyu. You might not have a ton of it, but as much as you can be mm-hmm. grazing in a way to encourage it to stay and to persist and to increase, you know, you'll be in a better position if and when this little bug mm-hmm. ever gets. Yeah. Well, and I don't think any of us ever really expected to, or thought that there was going to be something that was going to come through that attacked the Kikuyu. You know, I mean, it's it, when it's when it gets set, it you like you said, it's a monoculture in there and it just it sets it up so well and it just is really resilient. I mean, you go through periods of drought where you just think everything's dead. You get a little bit of precipitation and it all comes back. So we never really thought that there was going to be something that was going to come and take it out. So <clears throat> so aggressively. So yeah. You, know. you even run a huge fire across it and right. a lot of it comes back pretty quickly, but mm-hmm. not, we, we have also had found some patches that are not coming back so well. So mm-hmm. yeah, right. it's been so dry, so dry, so dry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and the wind doesn't help. What, when D3, the wind comes D4? Hawaii counties in D3, D4? Mm, two, two, three, I think. Oh, we in two, two three. three? Yeah. Not the whole county, but certain certain parts of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I knew Maui Portland was already declared a yeah. Maui's in a real severe drought. drought. I just was on the drought map this morning, and yeah, Maui County is way worse affected. Mm-hmm. But, oh, you, so any you, other you guys have a program. You guys are working with the deer on Maui, or you're just trying to get something started. I mean, there's been some questions to us mm. too about that, but I don't know that there's anybody doing any. We don't have a program or practice that can specifically and directly deal with the deer, <clears throat> but we can help land managers to look at the numbers of deer and the number of cattle and help them assess um, kind of that forage animal balance again, mm-hmm. yeah doesn't matter what type of animal it is, the more animals that are out there, the more of a demand you have for grass. Um, So we can help them in assessing those things. We can help them in looking at the ecological condition of their land and making the connections about what it's tied to. Um, We can encourage them to explore possible solutions. I'm a big believer that we could be doing more for harvesting these wildlife, uh, particularly the deer. The deer Mm -hmm. are a very, very desirable protein source uh, for Mm -hmm. a lot of people Um, Mm -hmm. on Maui in particular, um, and to some degree on Molokai, um, there is some level of harvesting that is going on. And I think that needs to be uh, continued and we need to continue to look for ways to support and encourage that kind of management because that's really, it it is management. Mm -hmm. 
and and come alongside ranchers to to do that in ways that are also sensitive to their concerns. You know, a lot of the ranches that have these animals, like the deer, um, they they don't want them eradicated. They recognize a, a value of these animals for recreational hunting and you know food sustainability for the community mm-hmm. and stuff. And I think that's that's all fine and well. But we have to again have these difficult conversations where we start talking about numbers because our land is only going to be able to do what it's healthy enough to do, just mm-hmm. like us, right? Mm-hmm. We run ourselves ragged. And we dig, we erode our health to the point where we can't function because pretty soon we can't function. Oh, yeah. And our land is kind of the same way. Um, I've, I've had the unpleasant experience of being in places in Hawaii that are being destroyed. We have kaho'olave happening all over again on a few of our islands because of overgrazing of wildlife mm-hmm. animals. And, and sometimes, you know, there's cattle producers that are still trying to raise cattle in these same environments. And they are so far in the red when it comes to a forage animal balance. It's, it's really, really sad mm-hmm. and it's really hard. And I understand where they're coming from trying to produce livestock, but they're stuck because there's this problem that is very, very large, very controversial. There's sometimes very vocal voices in the community that are very anti ranchers yeah. doing anything um, or anybody really doing anything to touch these wildlife. Mm-hmm. And what they don't realize is it's costing everybody. It's, mm-hmm. you, know, you know who's bearing the brunt of the cost actually is our children mm-hmm. because these lands are eroding sometimes at phenomenal rates and they are totally smothering marine ecosystems that are going to take decades, if not mm-hmm. centuries, who knows how long Mm-hmm. to ever heal or recover if that will even ever happen right yeah you know we can we can't sometimes we don't even know if it's even possible and it could be preventable mm-hmm. it could be preventable again the, the no action is still a decision mm-hmm. you know and so trying to trying to figure out um how we can come into those conversations and provide good decision support information mm-hmm. so that the ranchers and the wildlife managers and even the special interest groups, the hunters and Mm -hmm. the conservation people, like, you know, we all got to come around the table at some Mm -hmm. point and we have to agree that we have some compatible goals and figure out how we can put our differences aside and agree on some solutions that help preserve our long-term landscape health and, and, and really overall islands ability to sustain our ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't have a watershed that functions, we won't be here much longer either. Yeah. You know, yeah. if we can't yeah. have water, we're done. Yeah. We're done. Desalinization is really expensive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and and desalinization doesn't do nothing to support a landscape that can provide, you know, all the other Ooh. creature uh, needs that we have. Say, yeah. Yeah. Like climate buffering and all yeah. these great things. Yeah. So yeah, there's there's a lot there. Um and we, we wanna be a part of those conversations. I know I sure do. Um and I'm, I'm grateful every time we get the opportunity. Uh, we are working with our, the, the real place where I think the real opportunity for um, uh, leadership and involvement at the local level for these problems, I feel like are really at the Solon Water Conservation District. They have a unique position and responsibility, um, particularly in these landscapes that are eroding to be able to, to come alongside the ranchers and because often the boards are comprised of people that are in agriculture. I mean, they're supposed to be, mm-hmm. um, but mm-hmm. that's where I think we can, we can, that's a table I think we can gather around and um, start having these conversations because that whole, that entity's whole purpose is the land's health. Yeah, it's a soil and water conservation district. I mean, that's their whole function. And so I really think there's an opportunity there. They are our local partners. Um, we, we are at that table with them gladly and, um, would like to continue to be. And I think that's where we can start to brainstorm and, and find creative ways. I mean, mm-hmm. just because we don't have a practice yet that we can directly deal with the rent, with the, with the problem, maybe we can come up with some creative solutions for how we can, we can use the practices that we do have. Um, I don't know. There's, I think there's, there's lots of potential, uh, solutions we could discuss. Yeah, that's important. I think everybody just needs to be able to sit down and like you said, have that conversation, because I think, you know, and gathering them around because there are, um, there are a lot of concerns from different groups. 
And um, I think it's important for us to just hear and, you know, try to find a solution together. So, yeah, um, respectfully. Yeah, yeah I mean. exactly. Well, thank you so much, Carolyn, for joining us today and coming on That's the it. show. We really appreciate it. Um, and taking the time out of your day. Hope our listeners can have gained some insight to some proper grazing management and the programs um, that NRCS provide um, and where to reach out to. And, you know, and remember how important it is um, that what you do there on your grazing land, how it impacts uh, our whole entire ecosystem of things that goes on. So really appreciate it. Is there anything else you'd like to share or add? Um, thank you for having me. Um, I was really tickled to be invited to come and, and talk story with you guys on here. And it was certainly a pleasure. Um, I'd be, I, I really appreciate the invitation. And it's really nice to meet you, Shannon. Look nice forward to working with you. Um, yeah. Now I know I, I have someone I can call when we have an economic problem. Yeah, um, yeah for sure. Somebody. Give me a call. <laughs> yeah, yeah, appreciate it. Um, but I'm really glad you guys are doing this. I think podcasts are a great way to um, share information. Um, I love podcasts because I can listen to them when I can listen to them. And <laughs> that's, often that's I why can. we started it. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big podcast fan. Um, there's usually more podcasts that I want to listen to than I have time for, mm-hmm. but um, <laughs> yeah. they're good. Yeah. And and I, where I live out in the boonies, we don't have cell phone reception. So I like that I can download it to my phone and listen to it when I go for a walk or Same. when I leave the house. So. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. We're so glad that you were able to join us today on the show. Um, We're very thankful for you to take the time, Carolyn, for talking story with us. And I hope our listeners were able to gain some insight into some proper grazing management strategies and how it can impact their grazing, the grazing lands and the ecosystems that it's all involved in. So thank you again, Carolyn, for joining us today. Make sure to join our Facebook page, the Livestock Extension Group, if you haven't already. And be sure to visit the UHC TAR Extension website and our YouTube channel listed in the show notes below. For additional information about this topic, you can see the NRCS website listed in the show notes of the podcast and the description box of our YouTube page. Thanks again for listening to Livestock Balaao. And before we go, make sure you show some love for your favorite podcast as Shannon That's would say. Us. That's us. <laughs> Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or any of the platforms that you enjoy. Then stay tuned again for next month's episode where we'll be talking about a poultry inspired by our holiday of the month. Thanksgiving. I'm so Aloha. excited. Ahoy ho. Till next Ahoy time. Ahoy ho. Malo.